We're going to start with uh, your name. Could you tell us your name and spell it? My name is Colleen Black. C-O-L-L-E-E-N. B-L-A-C-K. Terrific. Good job. Thank you. All right, what we need to do is find out about um, where you're from and how you happened to get to Oak Ridge in uh, World War II. Tell us about that. Okay. Uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, down the road a piece. Uh, I came to Oak Ridge in 1944. I graduated from high school in 1943, and I couldn't come then because housing was so short. You could, you could get a job, probably, in late 43, but you couldn't get housing. My uncles worked here. They were in construction, and I had three uncles who worked in Happy Valley. That's right, at K-25. They were working on the project, the secret project. I had a couple of uncles who were working in the city of Oak Ridge uh, Stone, for Stone Webster and somebody else, and they lived in Trailer Camp 6 where in Happy Valley, they lived in trailers, huts, whatever they could get. But there were not, probably not anything for families right away. Uh, so I came with my parents in 1944, early 1944, and uh, got a job at Ford Bacon and Davis. Uh, I was a leak test operator. That meant that I would find leaks in a pipe in the wells and um, mark it, send it back if it had a leak, and if it didn't, put an okay on it. And I didn't know where it was going, what it was going to carry in those pipes, and I didn't ask. We weren't supposed to. Security was very tight. And um, my mother was an inspector because she was older, I guess, and had more sense than I did. But there were many, many girls just my age out of high school who were working. And at one time they said these, um, mass spectrometers, and we weren't supposed to say that word, uh, could only be operated by PhDs. But then they found out that if you taught these Tennessee girls how to operate the machines, they did a good job. And um, we climbed all over the pipes and did a good job finding the leaks with helium. And I didn't know the whatever went to it. I mean, the GIs knew exactly what they were doing and why the machines worked like they did, but I didn't know, didn't care, didn't ask questions. We were doing something for the war effort, and um, I wanted to win the war quickly and get back home to Nashville, Tennessee, um, because my brother was fighting in Europe, and I wanted to bring him home, bring home my uncles and friends, and, and just get back to normal. So that's, that's why I came here and why I stayed here. Uh, at first, I lived in a trailer with my parents, very crowded. There were 10 children in the family, but uh, I signed up for a dorm room. My brother uh, signed up for a hut. Um, once brother was work uh, was serving in Europe, and the little children were going to school in Happy Valley. In Happy Valley, I guess there were 13,000 people living in Happy Valley in the little trailers, and they had a whole community, a post office, um, they had a bowling alley, grocery store, dry goods store, anything you would want, it was right there. They also had uh, recreation halls. Uh, you could uh, go dance the night away and uh, just make sure you were there for your shift the next day. Uh, they worked three shifts at, um, at K-25, rotated shifts sometimes, and Everybody was busy and everybody was in a good mood and they were all working for the war effort. Um, and later I got my dorm room in the city. And uh, it was a one, wonderful place to be. Can you describe, um, backing up a little bit, I think that was, that was great. What, um, what did you know about K-25? What is, let's, can you just say K-25 was and then tell us what it was, what it meant to you. Was it just a, I mean, it sounds like a box of cereal. <laughs> it does. K-25, I didn't know what it stood for. I just knew I went to work there at K-25. I knew it was big, but I was in a small section. I wasn't in the great big U building 
and I didn't even know it was a great big U building. I just knew it was a great big building. And we were off in the conditioning building, they called it. We conditioned things to go in the great big building. I knew we didn't keep all these pipes and all the things that we conditioned in the condition building. And there was also a lab in the conditioning building. I don't know what they did. My cousin worked in the lab. She never told me what she did. I never told her what I did. But she would always come home with the holes all in her clothes from acid that ate through. Um, I had to wear overalls or pants because we had to climb up on the pipes. And uh, in those days, women didn't wear pants. Usually they just wore skirts. Um, but, you know, we did what we were supposed to do and we didn't talk about it. Uh, we got to work by bus, or in, in K-25, when I lived at K-25 in the trailer camp, uh, I could walk to work, and they had cars that would bring us home to our trailer. It's hard to find. All the trailers looked alike. They were all khaki. It was always muddy. It was not, not very good living conditions. Uh, we didn't have a bath. We had a path down to the bathhouse. Um, but... Again, you do anything for the war effort, and we did. That's great. Um, did your whole family come, 10 people, jump in the car from Nashville? Tell us that story. <laughs> well, it was almost the whole family. Like I say, I had a brother in the service, so he was overseas. And um, the children didn't come right away because we had to get housing. And my mother came first because... She wanted the job, and she got the job, but she couldn't get the housing because a woman was not considered the head of the house, and she had to have a husband. My father was a postal clerk in Nashville, Tennessee, and he couldn't quit his job because it was essential to the war effort. And if he quit, then he could not get a job because nobody would give him a job. You know, it was unconstitutional to quit your job. So he did quit because he wanted to join my mother. So and he, we had to have him to get the trailer. <laughs> so anyway, he quit and he was a house husband with the little children. And like, like I say, I was already up in, one brother was up here. And uh, so it took a little while to get the whole family together. But it was the war again and you, that we just had one car. So that took time to get us all together, all in the trailer, and it was very crowded, but we ate in shifts, we worked in shifts, ate in shifts, slept in shifts, <laughs> and and we managed. So it was, my mother kind of said, you know, just pretend like you're camping. You know, we didn't move our furniture. Uh, we rented out our house in Nashville to uh, an officer who was at, um, oh, someplace in Nashville, stationed in Nashville. And so that was the patriotic thing to do, to rent it furnished to an officer and his family. So that's what we did, whatever it took. Um, let's see, we were talking about elite detection. Um, how many, how many uh, women were involved in the project? You mentioned that um, there were several Oh, there were many women involved. You know, the men had been drafted. I mean, it, there was a manpower shortage. And uh, so the men who were here were, you know, top brass or 4Fs or GIs. I mean, it was an Army looking camp, and I guess the Army ran this area. It was just strictly everything was according to the Army. You did everything. All the rules and regulations were, were Army. So... That's, that's the rules we live by. And whatever they said, we did. Tell, tell us about what, um, ha when Happy Camp, was, or Happy Valley was built, and when you, you mentioned there were 13,000 people there, and it went, I mean, over what period of time did it grow, and how long did it last? Well, it was probably in 43 when they started construction of the K-25, because it was for the workers who uh, worked there. It was J.A. Jones. You worked for J.A. Jones Construction Company. Most, I mean, the men did, the ones who could get the trailers for the families. And then the women worked whenever, they, there was no problem getting a job. They would train you if you were trainable. You know, if you had high school education, you trained for something like I did, and if you had a college. But, you know, in those days, the women, 
there were not any engineers that I knew of or any chemists or physicists. Uh, the women usually were educated uh, home ec majors, teachers, nurses, and they got jobs readily. And, um, and the others, they would train. I, we had a lot of teachers that came and they trained them for leak tests or supervisors or something like that. Um, and the women could not get housing on their own. The first thing, in order to get a house, you had, first you had to be married, and then you had to qualify. You had to have um, so many children of the opposite sex in order to get the proper housing. So housing was always short, it was always in demand. Flat tops were, oh, luxuries that we never got. And, um, and like I say, we never got out of the trailer at, at K-25. Uh, I guess we left there in late November 1945. I got married in 45, so my mother left and went back to Nashville. The war was over. Uh, so many people left. You know, Oak Ridge was just almost cut in two. But they asked you to stay on the job. But people who were from all over the country, the first thing they wanted to do was go back home, get back to normal, meet their loved ones who were coming back from overseas. So my parents left then and I got married and my husband was in a hut and I was in a dorm and there was no visiting. And uh, it wasn't until, well, I guess it was after the bomb was dropped, they did assign GI, married GI's housing and we got a victory cottage and we were delighted with it. And uh, anyway, from then on, when I, when I got pregnant, we got another house and another house. And I really wanted the D house. But in order to qualify, we had to go back to the hospital a lot of times. And I eventually had eight children. So I may have overqualified for that house. But I'm still in that house. It was, uh, it was designed very well. I guess in the beginning, when they first designed Oak Ridge, Roosevelt sent for Frank Lloyd Wright. He was the leading architect at the time. And he thought that he would do a good job because he knew how to do with the nature and the slope of the hills. And, you know, maybe we would have had falling water creeks running through our house. Who knows? But anyway, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright came down to Washington and they got in an argument. Roosevelt and Frank Lloyd Wright got in an argument and Roosevelt never asked him to design the houses. Instead, they got Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill to design the town. And it was very well designed. I mean, you know, they did uh, try to cling to the mountainsides and use the trees and keep the, the landscape like it was. So I think they did a real good job. But they didn't tell him what the house was for, what the town was for. They said, oh, it's a, it's a secret project. Well. They designed it anyway, <laughs> but uh, I think they had to expand it two or three times because first I think it was just for maybe 15000 and then, you know, as they went along, they could see they needed more and more help to complete this project. And uh, the men wouldn't come here without the families, and of course the families had to have schools and every other, you know, facility, the grocery store, and, and uh, so it was a whole town was built, and it was built around little neighborhoods that were great. They had schools and grocery stores in all these little sections. And that was good too. But you weren't supposed to tell your neighbor what you were doing or where you worked or anything about that. So life was, life was fun for the single girl, although it was very difficult to be a glamour girl in those days. And that's what Hollywood was projecting. You had beautiful long hair and how could you roll up your hair without bobby pins. They'd taken the bobby pins, they'd gone to war because of the metal. And I used to have little curlers, little metal curlers. They'd gone to war and my brothers had thrown them in the scrap pile for uh, one of the scrap drives. And everything was hard to get. Even if you had the money, you couldn't buy pots and pans, you couldn't buy towels, tablecloths, sheets. Everything had gone to war. And uh, shampoo, uh, it was, it was just difficult. Uh, we had to, I guess, in 1942, they quit making cars. They were making 
jeeps and tanks, airplanes, and they didn't make any cars. So we didn't have cars. And if we had the cars, we didn't have the gas. So we couldn't go places and do things. We were kind of restricted. And uh, we couldn't wear a nylon hose. The nylons were going to make parachutes. Uh, our lipsticks came in a little cardboard containers because the lipstick factories were making bullets. So it was very difficult to be glamorous. We tried, and we had leg makeup, and we would paint our legs to look like we had on hose. And then we'd take our eyebrow pencils and draw the seam up the side because that was the fashion then. But if it rained, look out. Shoes were rationed. And in Oak Ridge, that was terrible because of the mud and the boardwalks. If you had high heels, you'd lose them in the boardwalk cracks. And sometimes if you did a misstep, you would just go in the mud and the shoes would just disappear. And shoes were rationed, you couldn't buy anymore. Uh, we had a, a shoe repair shop in Jackson Square and it was open 24 hours a day because people had to get half soles and soles and sewed up shoes. I mean, it was very difficult. You couldn't buy boots. Sometimes I wore my husband's GI shoes to hang up the clothes in the yard because, you know, you couldn't go barefoot out there. A lot of women who worked in the offices down at the administration building would uh, carry their shoes and go barefoot because they had to protect their shoes. And, um, but we did look glamorous. And when the guys at the PX had a girlfriend, he would bring them soap in boxes and maybe a candy bar instead of flowers in a box of candy. And so those girls felt really pampered. Um, anyway, we, we had a good time and we could meet people from all over the country. And uh, it was difficult to understanding them and they had a hard time understanding us. When I first met my husband, he was from Michigan, graduated Michigan State. He was a GI, he was my boss, and I brought him home. And my mother just fell in love with him. She said, oh, he is so nice. He just hangs on your every word. And later my husband told me, well, I had to. I couldn't understand the words you were saying. So anyway, he finally got used to what I was saying, and, uh, and he slowed down his speech a little bit. But it, it was just a different life. And uh, for entertainment, there was ping pong. There were at the recreation centers. There were dances. We had 25 dances a week. You could go dancing every night, every shift. <laughs> And uh, there were no lights on the tennis courts, but um, Bill Pollock was the, the man in charge of the music. He did a beautiful job with these old fashioned records. And uh, so we danced on the tennis courts. I think it was the only place that didn't have any mud. It was free of mud. And, uh, and a lot of people met their future spouse on the tennis court. Uh, what else did we do? Oh, there was the library, and the library was a wonderful place. It had newspapers from all over the country because the people here demanded the newspapers. And um, I think they didn't have enough books one time, and they sent out a plea in the little Oak Ridge Journal. And uh, they said, um, please, we need some books. Well, you wouldn't believe how many books they got. Every family had brought a couple of books with them, and they donated it to the library. So we filled up the library, and we had a good place to go and read. And um, what else did they do? They, um, we had movies, and um, we ate in the cafeteria. And the cafeteria wasn't just for eating. We, we would eat and meet, meet and eat. And then maybe we'd stay along and have a sing-along afterwards, something like that. All good, clean fun. Big Ridge Park wasn't very far away, and usually they had buses going to Big Ridge Park. They wanted to keep up the morale of the people here in Oak Ridge. And usually every shift had a, a ball team, and uh, ball games were, were very popular, softball, football, anything. And um, that was the life. Okay, um, do you want to read us your poem? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. This is a poem we 
my husband and I wrote for one of the SED, that's the Special Engineer Detachment, who was stationed here during the war. Uh, and this, we wrote it for a reunion. We're fighting the war in a secret city. It's crowded, it's muddy, and it ain't pretty. We're fenced in, in barracks, a hut, or a dorm. Army life here is not exactly the norm. Oak Ridge, Tennessee is the city. It's not on any map. We can't give you directions. We don't want to take the rap. Nearby residents will not say, nor the workers who commute every day. We're secret. Security's tight. Guards on horseback patrol at night. MPs guard the seven gates and search cars too. No cameras, firearms, or fire water get through. We're fenced in behind barbed wire, and by the way, we're paid the usual Army pay. No GI calisthenics must we do, and ID badges must be worn in plain view. We work with civilians, helping each other. Our mission is secret, can't even tell mother. The mail is late, the laundry's lost, the meat is rationed, no steaks at any cost. We chow down three times a day, but not the usual Army mess. We eat in cafeterias with civilians, no less. We slosh through the mud to get anywhere, and we have mud on our feet clear up to our hair. It's hot. Buses are crowded. Some workers smell. Don't open the windows, the women all yell, or you'll be covered in dust from head to toe, and we're out of soap to add to our woe. We work in shifts. We do what it takes, making whatever our plant makes. We're special GIs, the chosen few, selected for our knowledge and high IQ. We work hard all day and play hard all night, but don't worry, we never get tight. The project is dry, no liquor allowed, but that doesn't seem to bother this crowd. We head for our PX, it isn't far, and we settle for a beer at the Casablanca bar. Or we go to the rec hall for dancing or ping pong, or we may join the girls for a sing-along. We love this life, the work, the softball games. The girls are pretty and wear badges with names. We love the tennis court dances, bowling, the spirit. We're happy behind the fence. We do not fear it. We attend church each Sunday at the chapel on the hill. It's for all denominations with different hours to fill. Many GI weddings take place here, so sweet. Brides in white satin dresses with muddy boots on their feet. Last one. <laughs> Whatever we're making, shh, we'll never tell. And someday we'll be able to tell. But we built something that will help win World War II. And I hope that everyone will be proud of us too. That's great. Can you read the last paragraph again? Just because you're just okay. the pages around. Whatever we're making, shh, we're making it well. And someday we'll be able to tell how we built something that helped win World War II. And I hope everyone will be proud of us too. That is great. That is a great poem. What fun. What fun. Yes, indeed. Well, that's going to be it. Okay. And, okay, that's it. And I wanted to tell you about the how young we were then. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here, but, hold that for you, so okay. Uh, we were so young then. Everybody in Oak Ridge was very young. Median age, what, 35? So, and later Margaret Mead came and she said something terrible is going to happen to this town. This is the town without a grandmother. You know, it's terrible. And now we're all grandmothers and great grandmothers, so I guess something terrible happened. But we were so young, we did not have a funeral home. And there was one that came in, oh, maybe way back in the 50s, and it had to go out of business. It didn't have any business, so <laughs> it went out of business. But now we have two funeral homes, and they're busy all the time. That's all. That's an interesting thought. Very interesting. Uh, let's see. Why don't we pick up on a couple of these things, since you were annotating it you know, before we got started reading it. Um, let's see what things you might want to elaborate on. Um, any, anything more come to mind on the, um, the guards on horseback, the security? Were you sort of afraid of, to go out alone, or what kind of roles did they have to 
So. Okay. In K-25, you could see the guards on horseback. And uh, my brothers used to go out and talk to the guards as they went by. And uh, no, we weren't afraid. I mean, and I've heard since then that people from Harriman and Oliver Springs would come by, little kids, they could see the light from a far away, see, and they would come and crawl down and watch the guard go back on horseback. And he was digging a little place to go under. And they would dig, 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 and maybe they'd have to come back several times. And they finally would dig enough to get under and come to Oak Ridge, and they loved Oak Ridge. We had movies, you know, we had canteens and places that these little kids liked. So that's what one of the guys told me that lived in, in Olive Springs and Harriman. So the guards were friendly on the, on the horseback. So what were they guarding against? What was well, guarding against people getting into the area. You know, when you came to the area, you had to have your badge to go in and to go out. Um, it was, uh, you couldn't live here unless you worked here. Oh, maybe unless you were really old and somebody said they had their mother living with them. I don't know. Uh, se security was tight, and I remember walking down the turnpike one day without my badge. I'd come in from work, throw my badge down, and just, I said, I'm going to the grocery store and just buy a loaf of bread and bologna, if we can get it, and uh, or peanut butter, and just make our sandwich in our room. And we were picked up by the MPs, where your badge. We didn't move. Oh, right over in the dorm, go get it. No, I was with my cousin. And uh, so the guards took us down, fingerprinted us, did the whole bit, because we weren't supposed to be seen without our badges. That's how tight security was. So now when you go to a party in Oak Ridge, they always stick a badge on you. Hello, I'm so-and-so. I think it reflects the olden days. Mm -hmm. With all that red mud, it was very difficult to stay clean and without any soap. And we didn't have automatic washers or dryers. And when we went to the dormitory, we had our own little scrub board and we had to take it with us and wash our clothes and hang them up and dry them. There was a laundry and uh, I think they shipped our clothes off maybe to Alabama or somewhere. But we call this laundry the shredder and uh, it would shred your clothes in about a week. You know, you'd come back and the buttons were crushed and the clothes were ripped up, but you didn't want to send your clothes to the laundry unless you really had to. And there was one guy who, oh, he was muddy every day. He worked out in the field and he always was muddy. And when he came in, he jumped in the shower with his clothes on because he said, I do my laundry and my bath at the same time, so. Well, in those days, I've heard people ask me about what was the black situation in, uh, in Oak Ridge in the early days. I don't believe there was a black situation. First, we didn't call them blacks. I mean, in those days, th that was not a good term to use for them. We called them Negroes, and uh, they were very nice, and I think they were as happy to be here as we were because there were jobs here, and they were making more money here than we could make anywhere. Um, the black people, I think, all over the country, the black people were segregated, and it was the same here in the South as it was in other parts of the South. Uh, I didn't really know many black people at that time because they didn't work in, um, in at K-25 that I knew them. They had other jobs. I think they did what they were qualified to do. And again, there was a housing shortage for the blacks as well as for the whites. And their qualifications were the same as ours. I mean, you had to, first you had to have a job here. And in order to get a, a house, there were no real estate agents. You couldn't go out and do a real estate agent. If you wanted to bring your family here, you had to find housing off the area, which is what a lot of the white people did and a lot of the whites that didn't qualify for housing in Oak Ridge. Uh, the unskilled laborers uh, got the worst housing, as you might expect. There were huts for them, um, dormitories, 
and they were restricted because, I mean, they had a dorm mother and they, you were not allowed to bring women in the men's dorm or men in the women's dorm. That's just the way it was for the blacks and the whites. The blacks were segregated over in uh, Scarborough, and, but that's, that was the custom in those days to have the blacks in a different part of town. Uh, they lived in huts and the GIs lived in huts and construction workers lived in huts because they didn't qualify for anything else. And the huts were cheap. They probably got less money a week than, say, the scientists did. So they didn't have that much money to spend and the huts were cheap. There were four persons to a hut and there was a stove in the middle and then there was no bath, just a path to the latrine or bathhouse, and I think it was the same for the blacks as it was for the whites. Um, actually, we didn't complain. I mean, my brother didn't complain. I mean, he was glad to get the job, get the house, because it was just a temporary situation. They weren't going to be here long. They were just here for the war effort. They were glad to be here rather than in the foxholes in Europe. Um, I don't remember shopping. I mean, we couldn't buy anything anyway, and so I don't know if they had their own shopping facilities. I think they had their own grocery store, everything, and I'm not sure about the schools. I believe they had to be bused to Knoxville, but maybe they didn't have enough children to build a school for the blacks. And like I say, as far as I know, they weren't complaining and we weren't complaining. And. Uh, I don't say it was a fair thing, but that's the way it was at the time. Good. Um, okay. What were the schools like for the whites and the shopping centers and so forth? Well, my little brothers and sisters went to school. They were crowded. They had children from every state in the Union. And uh, we had wonderful teachers. They had imported teachers from all over the country and uh, apparently they did a good job. I was through school by that time. But uh, sometimes they had three children to a desk, I heard. This was what my sister told me. And she said, but the teachers were lovely. They put uh, paper down the hall and while they were conducting one class and then they'd tell the children to draw something, pyramids or whatever, on the, on the walls and then they'd change seats. And it was wonderful. And you never knew who was gonna be there. In uh, Happy Valley, it was always shifting. Maybe some construction workers would be there one week and maybe they wouldn't be there the next. And sometime they would be there for the duration, say. So schools were very good. The teachers were very good. Can you, uh, is there any irony in the name Happy Valley? I don't know how they got that name. That was the, what was on the post office. I guess they wanted people to be happy and it was in a valley. And it was just in the shadow of K-25. This not a trace of it now. There were trailers on both sides of the road then, and um, huts, and barracks, and cafeterias. There's nothing there now. You, you wouldn't even know it existed. Do you remember the, uh, I mean, did you get to see much of the plant, like the S50 plant, the thermal diffusion plant? Across the river no, there? no, that was, that was restricting. Each badge, should have worn my badge, had a color code, and when you go in the plant, you could only go in this color. I mean, I think I had a color for my station, uh, one for the restroom, and one for the cafeteria, and I wasn't allowed to go in any other section of this conditioning building. And it was the same with all the others. I couldn't have gone to the, uh, to the big building. I didn't have the badge for it. So it was restricted even in the plant area. When you lived, you say you lived downtown for a while. How did you get back and forth to the work? The bus. In the beginning, the buses were free. They were crowded, and they were free. They called them cattle cars. And I think they had come from Chicago, from the World's Fair in 1934, and they had come to Oak Ridge. We needed so many, many buses. And there were um, benches on either side of these cattle cars, and they had a stove in the middle, too. And uh, you would slide back and forth on it, and uh, they'd just pack those buses from there to K-25. You'd run down it, stand in line, get on the bus, and it was free. And uh, it was wonderful. 
I mean, you talk about shifts. Were there shifts 24 hours a day? 24 hours a day. You could go to the cafeteria. You could work. Uh, it was kind of like Las Vegas. You didn't know what time it was. Everything was, was booming. Yeah. Maybe you can say that again because they won't hear my question. But you can say the shifts were 24 hours a day. Uh, they had 24 hour a day shifts. They there were three shifts, 24 hours. They had the day shift, the afternoon shift, and the midnight shift. And sometimes people rotated, and sometimes you were permanent on one shift. A lot of people loved the evening shift. Some wouldn't work anything but days. So it was uh, to please everybody. Did the, was, it, was there overtime or extra pay allowed? For the uh, there was. There was overtime for, uh, uh, I guess the women probably couldn't work overtime. The GIs worked around the clock. I mean, it was just, if they needed them, they worked. And, of course, they didn't get any extra pay. But the others, what did they call it, time and again or double time? It depended. Oh, what were the, the 40-hour week, I guess, hadn't come in yet. I don't know. I'm not too sure about that. I just know I worked when they told me to. I don't know, really. I'm now, what else should I, what other, what, maybe we'll go into the category of other funny stories. Oh. <laughs> I don't they know. help people, you know, in the future understand what life was like, what it was like. We talked about secrecy, we talked about... Oh, oh we talked about secrecy. Oh, with the secrecy thing, uh, they had churches here, you know, and they had cemeteries here and you were allowed to bring the body back to bury, you know, your family because of the family plots. And what they told me is uh, when the bodies came in to be buried, that the guards would stick a pin in the body to see if it was alive or if it was a spy. So if it didn't scream or shout, they could be buried. <laughs> well, that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, the other thing, let's see. I should have written some notes. Mm. I don't know. What about what? Tell us about uh, the chapel on the hill a little bit. I mean, tell us about. The, I'd like a little snippet on the chapel on the hill. What it was, the Alexander Inn. What it was and what went on there. And, so okay. Either, I don't know, just bear or change your wedding dress or, you know, oh. whatever. Something little about each of those. Okay, properties. the chapel on the hill is still there. And in, in those days, it was for all denominations. The Catholics got it at 5.45 in the morning. Thank you very much. And then we could go to Mass and go to work on our shift. And that's, that's what we did. We also got it back maybe at noon. And in the meantime, we had Mass at the Grove Theater and the Center Theater. And my little brothers and sisters loved to go to the theater that, because they didn't have to kneel, you know, they could just sit in the, in the seats. But the, it was funny to watch at the chapel on the hill because the Catholics have a crucifix and they would hang the crucifix and then another would come in and take down the crucifix and put up a plain cross. And then the Catholics would come in and set up a confessional down front where you could see. We didn't really like that. We liked the old confessional boxes with the curtains. But if you went to confession at the chapel on the hill, you had to be in plain view of the people in back of you. I mean, and it, they set up little chairs and the priest would hear your confessions. But it worked. Anything for the war effort. And uh, they were always crowded. Now, that was one place you had to stand in line, too, to get to church. You know, it was just crowded. Everybody wanted to go to church. Um, and the guest house was right down from the chapel on the hill. And it was... Because so, we're going to have sort of like two segments, so start with the Okay, guest. okay. So, the guest house. The guest house was located down from the chapel on the hill and across the street from the recreation hall. Uh, the day I got married, you know, I, the night I stayed at the guest house to get ready. Catholics usually got married in the morning. I don't know why, but they usually did. Because if you went to Mass, you had to fast 
rules in those days. Anyway, I wanted to get married as late as I could, and that was noon. So I was married at high noon at the chapel on the hill. But I had to schedule it. There was a line for weddings, you know. Um, so we were going to schedule it so we would have um, the other people who were getting married before and after us, we were going to use the same flowers. And I wanted to be married last that day so I could take the flowers to the reception. You know, we were saving, saving. So anyway, I, I stayed at the guest house. And my brother was supposed to pick me up and take me to the chapel for the wedding with my boots on. And it was spitting snow. And um, he forgot me because there were so many children in the family. He made so many trips from the trailer to the church. And he just got to the church and collapsed, and I wasn't there. Of course, the bride is the least <laughs> important person in a wedding. And uh, so finally they discovered, I mean, the organist played and played, and I wanted to run up the hill in my wedding gown, but the clerk at the guest house said, no, no, you can't do that. So anyway, my father was in his outfit, and uh, it was a military wedding, of course. All the GIs were in uniform and my husband was in uniform and I finally got to the church but when I got to the church the photographer had already gone he said you know he was scheduled and he couldn't wait for me so I did get married at the chapel on the hill and it was much afternoon but I guess it was legal and then afterwards we went to the rec hall across the street for the reception and it was on Thanksgiving Day because we were having two Thanksgiving days that year. I don't think it's ever happened again. The government had changed it to make room for Christmas shopping, a holiday or something. Anyway, um, we went down and the guest house was booked so we couldn't have the reception at the guest house. Guest house, you could get a room for a night for 250 or maybe $3 with a private bath. So it was a very busy place, and that's where all the famous scientists stayed under assumed names. You know, there were, there were many guests there, but you never knew who they were. But um, anyway, that, it, the wedding went off as per schedule, even though it was late. And um, the reception was okay, and they brought the flowers down to use for the decorations. And the cake arrived, and everything went off well. So that was mismatched. I should have written it. Story. That's great. Oh, no. That's yeah. terrific. But, uh, That's wonderful.